Welcome, everyone, and thank you for joining us for today's webinar, A Practitioner's Guide to Messaging Apps for Development. I'm Catherine Cheney, Senior Reporter here at DevEx, focused on the West Coast of the U.S. and topics including ICT for D, and I'll be your moderator today. So as you all know, nearly half of the world's population uses one or more messaging applications. And increasingly, development organizations, which is what brings many of you here today, are seeing the value of using these apps to reach the people they serve. The Digital Impact Alliance did some research on this topic, and today we will hear about some of those findings, plus learn from organizations who are doing this work in the field, seeing the exciting opportunities, and also grappling with some of the very real challenges. If at any point you have difficulty viewing or hearing the presentation, please just send us a message in the Q&A box and we'll do our best to assist you. So today I'm joined by Megan reinard Guile, Senior Advisor for Technology for Development at Mercy Corps, Debbie Rogers, Managing Director at the Prague Health Foundation, and Jake Watson, Senior Director for Platforms and Services at the Digital Impact Alliance. Feel free to submit your questions at any time using the Q&A box and I really do encourage you to send those questions in throughout the presentation today, as this is really all about creating value for you and your work in this space. After the presentation, we'll try to respond to as many of your questions as possible. So without further ado, I will hand it off to Megan. Great, thank you, Catherine. Um, so as Catherine mentioned, my name is Megan reinard Guile. I'm a senior advisor on Mercy Corps Technology for Development team. And basically what we do is we advise our teams globally about how to incorporate different types of technology tools into their programming. Um, and I focus specifically on ICT technology and connectivity for our, our program participants. Um, and so as a result of that, part of my portfolio of programs that I manage is the Signpost program, which is a partnership between Mercy Corps and IRC that was started back in 2015 as a way to reach crisis-affected populations with information. Uh, so the problem is pretty simple. Um, Crisis-affected populations often do not have access to accurate and verified information about their situation. Um, it's either difficult to reach or get the information or they receive it at a time of crisis. So they have um, limited ability to understand and action the information. The information is out of date. It's in the wrong language. Um, the list goes on and on as to why they can't access that information. And so our goal with this program is to be as responsive to those barriers to information as we possibly can. So the signpost program as I said, connects vulnerable populations in the areas we work with the vital information that they need to solve their most pressing problems. So it's very user-centered. Um, we, we start with a human-centered design process, and then we design our content strategies based on the types of information people need and are asking for, rather than a more prescriptive information dissemination strategy, which has been used in the past. Um, as I mentioned, at the global level, we are a partnership between Mercy Corps and the IRC, the International Rescue Committee. We've been supported by Cisco, Google, Microsoft, and TripAdvisor, among others, um, with both financial support and with in-kind support. So we've really utilized working with the private sector to better understand human-centered design principles and then apply those to how we're working. Um, the first instance of, of signpost was, in, was called refugee.info. It started in 2015 in Greece. Um, it was a very simple mobile app that people could download that basically provided them simple service information. So how do I register in a camp? Um, where am I? Because many times they had no idea where they had landed. Um, what are the basic services that I can receive here? Um, and it worked both on and offline. Um, another big strategy that we use is partnerships. So I mentioned our, our big partners, our global partners, but every one of our instances also is an active partnership. So we, we conduct service mapping. We make sure we're working with the local actors, with other INGO actors, with government actors, so that we're able to provide that really comprehensive information experience to our users um, so that they, don't have, they can go to a single place for the information that they need. So Signpost believes that if we provide interactive, accessible, accurate, relevant, responsive, and timely information to people made vulnerable by man-made crises and natural disasters, then they will be empowered to address their needs and make informed decisions. 
So at the end of the day, our ultimate goal is that people are empowered to be independent, to make decisions for themselves. And that's what we're always striving for. Um, our target audience is, is pretty broad. Uh, we really try to, to not be specific about who we're targeting, um, but we do try to be specific about how we are reaching people. So we want to make sure that the information that we provide is relevant and useful to the populations we know are in need of information. Um, we also make sure that it's delivered on the platforms that they are using. So be that Facebook Messenger, WhatsApp, um, a website, uh, in some cases, analog. So we, we want to provide a diversified set of communication channels so that we're not creating an inadvertent barrier um, by not providing information in an accessible way. To that end, we also provide Wi-Fi hotspots in areas where it's relevant so that people who, can, who can't access information because they don't have access, access to connectivity are able to do so. Um, in the beginning of the Greece crisis, I think about 50% of our beneficiaries uh, logged on to our services via the Wi-Fi hotspots we were providing in, um, in refugee camps. So where are we? Um, at the height of the, the Syrian refugee crisis in Europe, we were active in seven countries. Um, so we were, we were active in Greece, Serbia, Bulgaria, Hungary, Italy, um, and then we also have expanded to Jordan and El Salvador. Uh, in, in Europe, we have since scaled back, so we've actually handed over some of our information services to partners on the ground as the, the crisis became less, uh, less acute. So we're no longer active in Serbia and Bulgaria, but we're still very active in Europe or in, in Greece and Italy. Um, and I'm actually in Jordan right now uh, working on a year two design workshop for Hebrona.info, which is the instance that, that we have running here in Jordan. Um, and then we also have an instance in El Salvador that's focused on providing service map information to um, sufferers of gang, gang violence. So as I mentioned earlier, we have a few elements of program design that all we adhere to across all of our programs. Um, first and foremost is that it's human-centered design focused. So we, we build capacity of our teams on the ground and we always start with this, with this approach and we adhere to it throughout the life of the program. Um, to that end, we never stop iterating. So as the context changes, as the population changes, as the information needs change, we adapt our programs. Um, a very good example of this is as I mentioned earlier, when we started in Greece, um, we provided a very simple service-based information app. And then as the, the crisis became protracted, we changed the strategy because the, need, the information needs became much more specific and context-based. And so we, we created a Facebook page. We really built up the kind of two-way responsive communication mechanisms that we have now. Um, and so we were able to be Okay, um, we are going to let Megan reconnect her audio. Apologies for that. Um, and I will wait to hear from her that she is back online. Um, meanwhile, uh, Debbie, I hate to put you on the spot, but if you are um, ready to talk a little bit about how the Preakout Foundation is working on this, um, we can return uh, to Megan once she gets her audio back. Um, one thing I, I just wanted to note from Megan's slides that I love is uh, the way she bolded the word if, and she said, if we provide interactive, accessible, accurate, relevant, responsive, timely information. Uh, so my hope is that we can dive into what exactly does that look like in the Q&A? Um, because I think those are some of the uh, elements of success here that kind of separates success from failure when it comes to messaging apps. Um, so we'll let Megan go ahead and reconnect her audio. But meanwhile, um, if we could just switch the slides over to Debbie, let's go ahead and hear uh, about how the Pre Help Foundation is using messaging apps to connect women to care. Debbie, you want to go ahead and jump in? Yeah, sure, no problem at all. Um, and uh, just let me know when when Megan's back <laughs> back on the call. Um, so sure. yes, as you said, I'm uh, I'm Debbie Rogers. I'm the managing director of Pregnant Foundation, and I'm specifically wanting to talk about um, a program that we're involved in called Mom Connect. So Mom Connect is a South African National Department of Health initiative, um, which uses SMS and WhatsApp communication to improve the health of pregnant women 
newborns and infants at national scale. So what do I mean by national scale? Um, every scale is different. <laughs> While we're in 95% of the public clinics in the country, we've registered over 2.5 million mothers to the program since we launched in 2014. And this represents approximately 80% of the mothers giving birth in these public clinics over that period of time. We also have huge amounts of engagement at any one time we have around 860,000 active users on the platform, and they generate approximately 1,700 messages to our help desk daily. And really without um, the fact that this is driven by the South African National Department of Health, we never would have been able to reach this kind of scale. Um, but as the tech partner to, to this program, I'm gonna talk a little bit more specifically around the communication elements um, of Mom Connect. So, Back in 2007, before Mom Connect even started, we started as an organization sending out messages to mothers to tell them about how to care for themselves, demand generation messages, self-care messages. And I think this is a, a, a model that probably most people are um, sort of aware of and have seen in practice in many ways. Um, but in 2009, when we started this, and we were sending out these messages, we made some pretty big assumptions that people would understand that what we were doing was sending them information. There was a computer behind this SMS um, and that we weren't expecting them to respond. But of course, as um, the best things happen when you are surprised by your results, um, that wasn't how it worked. So we started getting questions back from mothers um, because they believed that the person on the other end of the SMS was the nurse who had signed her up at the clinic for the service. Um, and so we st very quickly realized that um, this was not just going to be us sending that information to mothers, but rather that it was going to start to be a conversation. And we soon learned a lot more about the way that people would respond. Not only did they send back health questions, um, but they did also um, send back all kinds of interesting things that we hadn't expected for, um, uh, and we could then respond to them through this, this help desk. So some of the unexpected results that we had, um, for example, we uh, were able to see that there were stockouts, um, not only where they, uh, that there was a stockout, but exactly where they were. Were they at, in a specific province, in, at a specific clinic, or nationally a stockout? We were able to pick up um, or detect stockouts of iron folate and immunizations faster than any other stockout system that is currently in operation with the National Department of Health on any at any level, um, whether that be clinic, district, or national. Um, because we were telling mothers to go and get immunizations or to take their iron folate pills, and when they got there and there wasn't anything, they told us very quickly what they think about that. So that was an interesting use case. And we started to think if we can get this kind of information when we're not even specifically soliciting it, what could we get if we did start to sp uh, solicit specific responses? So for example, could we get ratings of how people felt that they were treated at a facility? or how long they waited at a facility, or even what was the quality of care that they received at a, at a facility? Were they given their uh, the appropriate tests at the appropriate ANC visit, for example? And we started to realize that rather being a service that sent messages to mothers, um, this was a service that was around, about two-way communication and about connect, creating connections between different actors in the healthcare system. And we started to look at what the potential of connecting all of these actors could be. Um, for example, if you're connecting a patient to the health system and the health worker to the patient and the health system, what are the kinds of things, needs of all of these different actors that we could, um, that we could meet? So for example, the patient might have um, information she needs about health, but she can also provide feedback on the quality of care that she receives that would never have been accessible. Um, the people on the health system side need data about this quality of care, and they can provide the health, uh, improve the health system if they get this kind of quality uh, information back. The health worker themselves need, need support to build resilience um, with only uh, 3% of the health workers in sub-Saharan Africa 
uh, but 24% of the disease burden, our um, health workers are completely overworked. Um, but she can provide trusted information on health and can be um, a person who the patient makes a connection with. So we believe that connecting actors in the system leads to improvements of the healthcare system and ultimately also improvements of health for the patient. More recently, we have also seen, although we started with very basic technology of SMS and USSD, the massive potential that IP messaging platforms have, but particularly WhatsApp, because we have been getting a lot of feedback from others for a number of years that they would like to receive the messaging that we send over SMS via WhatsApp. And as you know, WhatsApp has massive scale, particularly um, in low and middle income countries with over 2 billion um, users who we can connect with. Um, and and so a little bit of more detail around why WhatsApp and why we think that it's been it, it was such a good opportunity for us for this program. Um, Sixty three percent of the mothers are on what's on non connect were WhatsAppable. Um, it's going to be a new word. Uh, it means that they were they had a WhatsApp account. It's very affordable um, in South Africa, even though we have high data costs, because many mobile network operators offer uh, data packages for WhatsApp. It is more secure in many ways than SMS because it is end-to-end -end encrypted. Um, whereas if you're sending an SMS, for example, this data does go through a mobile network operator and they do have access to that data. And it also offers so many more opportunities for richer engagement. You're not just stuck to the 160 characters. You can also send rich media and receive rich media. So in 2017, we were really lucky to be able to form a partnership with WhatsApp to test um, using their API, their business API or enterprise API to deliver Mom Connect um, over WhatsApp and not just SMS. What we learned um, was really interesting. So we have now over 300,000 women who are active on the WhatsApp service. As I said, that's about 63% of the women in, in uh, on Mom Connect are WhatsAppable, and and this is the percentage that we've managed to achieve. Um, they were 6.7 times more likely to reach out to the help desk and 2.7 times more likely to remain engaged with the help desk. So they were much more likely to engage in conversation than to just be passive receivers of information. And we also saw all kinds of unexpected engagements, although we knew that it was possible, obviously, for images, videos, and voice notes to be sent to the help desk. We weren't entirely sure the way that people were going to use it. For example, we do receive beautiful photos of, of newborn babies, which lifts the heart of our help desk operators. But we also receive photos of people's HIV tests, ultrasound results cues that they are in at the clinic and all kinds of other interesting engagements um, from the mothers that we had never previously anticipated. And in general, what we learned um, actually is that with all of the, this further engagement that we had on the platform, we needed to think about engagement and conversation differently. It is not simply a swap out for SMS when you start to look at these kinds of IP messaging platforms. We completely broke our help desk system when we introduced WhatsApp because of the massive volume of engagement as well as the way that people are engaging. And in fact, we had to build a new tool, um, a new technical tool to be able to cope with this. Um, and we needed to start to introduce, and, and I know these are great buzzwords and everyone wants to sprinkle a little bit of AI fairy dust on all over their programs, but we've actually been forced to use natural language processing and artificial intelligence to help us to actually handle the volume of questions that we have. We have a human in the loop system, so nothing is completely automated. This is not a chatbot. The connections are still there. The conversation is still real, um, but we need the AI and NLP to help us to identify triage, classify, um, and improve the efficiency um, because four help desk operators currently handle all uh, 860,000 active users and all 1,700 messages that come through to the help desk every day. Um, and um, so it's been really exciting journey to learn just how different um, the model for IP messaging is compared to SMS. Um, it's been very interesting to break up previous conceptions of how we should engage and what engagement with 
um, mothers means. Um, and we're really excited to see how we can expand this work to other health areas, but also be able to offer some of our experience and, and learnings to, to other um, organizations who may want to do similar types of work. And um, we're really excited that we're able to support other nonprofit organizations um, and get them onto this kind of platform much faster than if they were having to start from scratch. So that's my, my story about Mom Connect. The evolution of starting with SMSs and one-way communication, how it's evolved, um, and now how it's expanded dramatically with the introduce, introduction of IP messaging. Great. Thank you so much for that, Debbie. Um, so I, I wanted to just quickly follow up on one thing I found fascinating. And again, I encourage participants to submit questions in the Q&A box. Um, but you mentioned end-to-end -end encryption. And uh, I hope in the Q&A we can talk about what are the stakes here, um, the kind of sensitive data that these women are sharing, and how important it is to make sure that's protected and, and what considerations you have to make along those lines. Um, but really great presentation. Thanks for that. Um, it looks like we have Megan back on audio. So I uh, want to hand it back over to you to tell us more about Mercy Corps' work using messaging apps. Great, thank you, Catherine, and apologies. <laughs> I always think it's a slightly entertaining when we're discussing technology and then the technology fails us. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I will pick back up and I'll, I'll speed up because I know we probably lost a bit of time. Um, so some of the ways that I wanted to highlight that we've been using technology differently or, or to sort of inform our information dissemination strategy differently is that we're able to use it at multiple levels. So we're, we're using technology to communicate with our users, obviously, but then also we're creating a very dynamic system between our teams. Um, so we have social media moderators who are from the populations we're serving, and they're actually the face of our program. So they communicate um, all, they have all of the communication with our, with our users. Um, and then when they receive questions, they are able to reach back out to our team via other, me other messaging apps like Slack or email, uh, who can be remotely based, um, who are able to verify information. They're able to to double check on policy changes. So they're usually the more journalistic team members who are actually liaising with government officials, with legal counsel um, to provide the information that we need for our users. Um, and so there's a very dynamic conversation that goes on, on the back end so that we're able to be responsive to, to our program participants as possible. Um, we also make sure that we are utilizing targeting um, via Facebook. So we're able to really make sure that we're reaching the audience that we're meaning to. Um, so if we have a post that's particularly targeted towards women or towards people who are trying to enter the workforce um, or towards children who need to reenter school or language learning, we're able to utilize um, Facebook targeting for good to reach the people that we want to reach. Um, we also have a really dynamic ability to, to coordinate, again, with multiple actors on the ground. So we have countless examples of where we have identified an issue or a challenge with a, with a certain type of programming or with a policy um, on the ground based on our users' feedback. And then because we do have connections with the various actors in the context in which we work, we're able to aggregate that information and take it back to them to discuss how to find solutions to that issue. Um, so a good example uh, is it was um, some of the cash programming in Greece. There was a lot of miscommunication about how to receive it, about what some of the criteria were for getting cash. Um, and we were able to work with the various different actors and then clarify that via a live, a live Facebook video for our users. Um, additionally, we've partnered with the Greek Ministry of Education uh, to provide information to our users about how to put their kids into school. So what was the registration practice that they needed to follow? So we're really able to build, get information on both sides and feed information back on both sides. So it's truly a loop. Um, just some quick stats. Uh, since 2015, we have reached over 1.3 million uh, users. We are active in four countries. We have about a 5% growth rate. And um, I think to date, we've had a, over 13,000 private messages, messages with people. So, um, and that's individual conversations. Um, we are active in seven languages. And on average, we have about 3,000 Facebook shares. 
Um, let's see. Uh, one of the things that we are always looking looking at measuring is the trust that our users have in us. So, you know, are they do they trust the information we provide? Do they feel that we're responsive to them and their needs? And, and do they feel that the information that they can that they receive from us is actionable? Um, one of the stats that we that we really like. Uh, we feel very strongly about and we're very excited about is especially in Jordan, 88% of our users do feel that they were able to action the information that they have received. Um, so sort of our next steps that we're thinking about, we want to share lessons learned and best practices about what we've learned about information dissemination and communicating with people via these multiple channels. So how do you understand the information ecosystem you're entering? How do you address the challenges and the barriers creatively? And how do you make sure that you're truly serving the needs of the populations that you're trying to reach? Um, we definitely want to expand to new geographies. We're exploring the US border as well as Colombia. Um, and we're actively looking for partners who want to work with us on that. Um, we're also always exploring new tools and approaches that are fit for purpose. So we want to make sure that we're meeting people on the communication platforms that they're using and we're responsive to that in the various contexts. Um, I think another big question we have is sustainability. So in the various kinds of crises we're responding to, acute versus protracted, what does sustainability of an information response look like and how do we hand over or close out responsibly? Um, so that's something we're definitely exploring in the various areas that we're working. Uh, so with that, I will hand it back to you, Catherine. And sorry again for the interruption. No worries at all. Thanks, Megan, that was great. Um, I see some questions coming in, which is fantastic. Please keep them coming. And um, we will return to uh, Megan and Debbie in the Q&A in just a little while. But earlier I mentioned research by the Digital Impact Alliance on messaging apps for international development with some really interesting findings. So I'm gonna hand it over to Jake to tell us more. Thanks, Catherine. Thanks, Megan. Thanks, Debbie. Um, just by way of introduction, I just, I wanna highlight, even though we're talking about research today, uh, prior to joining Dial, I worked uh, in the field kind of supporting probably many of the smaller programs. These these two case studies, I think, are, are programs that have gone to pretty large scale. Um, and so I'm guessing there's some folks on the call that also support you know, programs in the field that have much smaller scale. Um, so I just wanna acknowledge that uh, because I have been in your shoes before and share some of that pain. I do wanna start by highlighting um, the messenger research that we did and published about a year ago. Uh, it's available on the Digital Impact Alliance website. I think we'll be able to work in a link to it here. Um, but just by way of summarizing what we just heard from Megan and Debbie, uh, there are really four predominant use cases for messaging. That is matching people to resources, uh, information in the case of signpost, uh, also mom connect, but it could be money, it could be job, automated job finding. Um, it could be behavior change or, or peer learning networks uh, and groups. Uh, could be PSAs, public service announcements, information <clears throat> broadcasting. So for example, after the earthquake in Haiti, uh, Digicel offered uh, free PSAs. Uh, one example is, you know, wash your hands after you go to the bathroom. That was after the cholera outbreak. Or it could be used to gather feedback. Um, I wanted to, to level set there because the next piece of work that we just published yesterday, I believe, um, was really around pooling. Uh, it was about uh, the enabling environment and financing, innovative financing focus, right? So the, the hypothesis is that, you know, cost is prohibitive. Um, and is it possible to aggregate the demand for SMS, IVR, USSD, or money? to either drive down the cost and or increase the quality of service or potentially even um, incent uh, an MNO or aggregator to start service where they don't currently have it. For example, like Sierra Leone. Um, there was a paradigm for this before NetHope and USAID did this with broadband aggregation a while ago. And so the study that we just conducted um, was to see whether or not there was an opportunity to do that here. So what, what did we do? Um, we, we essentially went out and tried to size a market 
for mobile services in those five countries that you see at the bottom, Malawi, DRC, Tanzania, Ghana, Uganda. It was pretty um, exhaustive interviewing focus group uh, uh, effort across 78 organizations. You can see the metrics, five countries. Um, and from this, we developed a generalizable market sizing model. On this slide, uh, you can see what was in and what was out. Uh, essentially focused on sub-Saharan Africa and the development and humanitarian emergency response across health, ag, civil society, humanitarian, and education. Uh, we did not include government use, so it was really just donors, multilaterals, private implementers, NGOs, um, and then the channels you can see below. SMS, voice, USSD, mobile money. And really, it was just focused on the communication costs themselves. So what did we learn? SMS volume is largely driven by just a few uh, actors, largely UN agencies or multilaterals. Um, there really still is um, uh, Sorry, USSD, while being a strong technology, is not is not widely used still. Um, mobile money is still super popular, um, and there's a huge interest on both supply and demand for mobile money. Um, the mobile internet still hasn't really penetrated. Uh, it's not uh, widely used still. Um, one of the surprise, well, maybe not surprising for, for many of you, is that the aid sector is perceived to be difficult to work with by many MNOs and aggregators. And I think that uh, bears out in my own experience in that uh, the procurement process is difficult. Often payments can be delayed. For the MNO side, it's, it's hard to predict, uh, you know, is this going to be a value? Because most NGOs, you don't really know what the demand is going to be, et cetera. Um, and that uh, there's a lot of evidence that still needs to be generated there. So demand aggregation may be limited. Ultimately, demand aggregation is limited in scale and affected effectiveness given relatively small market size. In each of the countries, the total market size was only about a half million dollars to a million dollars currently. Um, so the following uh, are the next steps. We need to build awareness and capacity who, what, where, and how. We need to make connections. Essentially, supply and demand, if you're coming into a new country, you don't really know who the aggregators are. Um, so that takes a lot of effort. You need to know how to connect to their systems. Context is king. You're not necessarily sure which of the channels are predominantly used. Um, and then really, we would still need to gather more evidence. What works, what doesn't. Um, what is the impact? And then I've got some other slides here, but I'm going to stop there just because we went over a little bit before. So I want to open it up to questions. Okay, no problem. If you if you'd like to, Jake, we can we can take a few more minutes and just let some questions roll in. Happy to go through your slides. I know I've I've had the chance of seeing them ahead of time, but others who are joining might be curious just to go through them quickly. Okay, so um, essentially this was just some some background. Uh, data that we have on the affordability of, of mobile prepaid uh, as a percent of monthly average income. So you can see, uh, Debbie's already talked a bit about these slides and, and the fact that uh, WhatsApp is growing, certainly in South Africa and other places it's not um, quite as large. But that the, the biggest bullet here is that the lowest smartphone adoption is in Sub-Saharan Africa. So that's bad, but um, there is a large growth potential there. Um, messaging apps right now um, are still very difficult to work with. For example, the WhatsApp business API, uh, you can't really just have hire somebody to sit there and respond. Debbie talked about the need to uh, use automated responses and that even just to uh, handle the volume of responses they've had to introduce in natural language processing. Um, so, so while we found that aggregate um, pricing right now or aggregate demand and pool procurement isn't really 
feasible um, or doesn't provide a lot of value, we do think that it will at some point. Um, this one talks about gender and that uh, the gap in internet use between women and men increased in Africa, right? And so I think this raises um, one of the issues is that uh, if you are introducing one of these programs, um, there really is a large gender divide. And so phones can often be shared and that, you know, ultimately you have to do no harm. So uh, you can't really guarantee that the person on the other end of the phone is always that other person. So uh, you really have to be aware of the messaging, the type of messaging. Um, and how do you reach those folks, right? Because often they are sometimes the most vulnerable. Um, so this multi-channel approach to service delivery is that, you know, you can't necessarily just pick one channel and assume that it's going to work for everything. Ultimately, I think we'll see that we're going to move towards um, uh, having a multi-channel approach where users can opt in to, to various channel and, and, and receive messages on a multitude of channels without having to switch back and forth. Um, and then... The, yeah, I think I, so the considerations, right? Go where the pe people's attention is. So what channels are people using? Um, I think, you know, uh, Praykelt has had some success using USSD. Um, in other places, USSD is not prevalent at all. Facebook, uh, Megan alluded to Facebook being uh, used quite a bit by the Syria refugee population. So use what people are using. Focus on the user needs over the implementer needs. Um, you can engage more users with multiple channels. I just talked about that. And that the communications content um, really needs to be highly honed to that population. So context is key. Uh, Human-centered design, Megan talked about that, is super important. And that uh, partnering for scale and technical expertise, both of these organizations are, are that we heard from Mercy Corps and Breakout have uh, very experienced, highly technical staff. Many smaller NGOs don't have this luxury. And so in that case, you may consider partnering with uh, an aggregator or somebody like Viamo who has that technical staff because it is very difficult to set up these integrations and maintain them. Uh, so, These are some considerations. And then uh, let's see, we've got just some more data here about the key trends per channel. I would highly recommend just going and looking at the two reports. They're not super long. They're full of information. Uh, these things put things into context. Um, I mentioned that uh, Viamo, for example, if you look at the voice IVR horizontal, they are in 22 countries. So if you were a smaller uh, NGO or even one working in multiple countries, you may want to partner with somebody like Aviano who's in 22 or so countries, already have the connectivity in place, they have experience running campaigns, uh, et cetera. And that's pretty much Great. it. Great. Thanks so much, Jake. Thank you. And we do have some questions um, that have come in about your findings specifically, but I'm going to let more of those come in. So if you have questions for Jake specifically, keep those coming and I'll kind of bundle them together. Um, but first, I want to kick off with a question that came in that I think is one of the big questions and it was very well put. So I'll start with that, which is what steps are being taken or what steps can we take? to address some of the privacy and data security concerns related to the use of messaging apps. So some of you mentioned that there are concerns, but how are you actually addressing those concerns or what steps can be taken? Happy to let anyone jump in on that who feels compelled to comment. Um, I'd be happy from breakout side just to mention some of the things we take into account. I think, um, one of the things is you do have to think carefully about which channels you use and you have to be very aware of what the privacy concerns could be if you do use them um, for example we don't generally use facebook messenger because it doesn't have the advantage of things like end-to-end -end encryption that whatsapp does um, and because we're generally de dealing with sensitive health data and we cannot 
anticipate um, that there won't be very sensitive data coming through, like, for example, a photograph of uh, an HIV test, for example. Um, we tend to think very carefully about which channels we use in the first place. Um, then once you've made a decision on, on which ones to use, there, there are various advantages and disadvantages to, to all of the different messaging channels, including SMS and USSD, which, as I said, are not end-to-end -end encrypted either. Then it's very important that you um, consider things like data access policies um, that are are relevant to anyone who has access to it, not just your technical teams, um, but if you like, for example, we're a partner with the National Department of Health, they have a very clear data access policy. Um, and also one thing which I find is not generally well supported from a funding perspective, but something that as implementers we think is critical to put in place is very clear um, and strong security measures from a technical perspective. Um, it's important to look at the weakest link in the system and the weakest link in the system is generally people um, and you need to put in place uh, processes and guidelines that will help to reduce the the, the risk of, of people creating issues um, and i think generally try to follow the best practices out there um, you know uh, guidelines such as gdpr are extremely stringent and can be very difficult to implement but they do set a very high standard for how you should be considering data and personal information and uh, I personally think that's what you should be striving for, even if you're not in a country that insists on that kind of, of rigor. Um, I think as implementers, we know that it's a risk that we need to take into account. Um, and it's something a question that we get regularly. So it's, it's really important to, to put that front and center when you're dealing with any kind of data. Uh, and unfortunately, it's something that is not always uh, well funded or, or taken very seriously. But I can promise you when if there is a, a data breach or if there is an issue with your data being held by another company, um, you know, that's when you'll be glad that you put these measures in place. And, and I can respond to that, too, a bit. This is Megan. Um, so one of the things that we really focus on is is digital literacy efforts. So we want to educate our users as much as possible possible about how to be on the Internet as well. Um, so we we warn them about their you know sharing their private information online and and we always have that as a a banner on our pages. Um, we have bots that remove any personal information like phone numbers or passport photos from our Facebook our public facing Facebook pages and our social media moderators also monitor it as well and remove anything that's sensitive um, manually. And then one of the things that we also do is we really work with our, our, our social media moderators to make sure that we are not doing case management. So there is as little sort of personal information passing over any of the platforms that we're using as possible. So we try to provide people with the information they need to then action what they need to do. Um, but we are not taking on cases in a majority of our, of our programs. Well, Great. Thank you I think you, Jake, I think you, you both. Yeah, I just think, I mean, both of those answers are very comprehensive. And I would just uh, underscore the effect of technology here, which is one to amplify. And so, you know, if you if you aren't paying attention to what is the content of the message, um, it's going to be amplified, which could lead to disastrous results. And that ultimately, it really does come back to do no harm, right? So most of the places that you're working and the people you're communicating with are already in a vulnerable state. So... Uh, if in doubt, don't do it. Um, or if you don't think that you have the techno technical means or, or support to put into place those chat bots or you know the, the support staff that's needed to monitor and ensure that your databases are secure, your systems are secure, then, then perhaps seek help. Great, yeah, thanks again for that great question. And if there are any follow-up questions um, about data and privacy, um, feel free to keep them coming. But I think um, that was a really important conversation to include here. Um, Debbie, we have a few questions about MomConnect specifically. So I wanted to go ahead and relay those to you. Um, I'll, just, right. I'll throw them all out there um, and take them into <laughs> it. There's a question about um, what languages does your platform work in and how, if at all, do you work with um, illiterate users? Um, there's also a question on are you currently operating in South Africa exclusively, and are there plans to expand? Um, and then third, I would say there's, there are some questions around 
your use of artificial intelligence and natural, natural language processing, um, what are some of the challenges you've worked through and some of the lessons you've learned? So a whole list of questions, um, but <laughs> I, I thought I'd throw them out there for you and I'm happy to revisit. Cool, and I'll try and, and keep them, the answers fairly short. Um, so from a languages perspective, we offer Mom Connect in South Africa in all 11 official languages. Um, and um, that involves a lot of translation and back translation to ensure that um, we have accurately uh, represented things in very different languages. So for example, um, Zulu is a very descriptive language. Um, and so it's quite challenging to get that into a 160 character SMS. Um, but luckily, you know, we've had a lot of experience with that now because of having to do this in 11 languages. Currently, Mom Connect in South Africa does not particularly deal with uh, illiterate users on the platform. However, in countries where we have worked, um, where we have had uh, lower literacy rates than we have in South Africa, um, we have used voice um, as, as one of the alternatives. Um, voice is very challenging and very expensive um, compared to text-based communication. But obviously, if you're trying to reach less literate users, then um, you do need to be able to do that. Um, WhatsApp does, of course, allow also for, for voice notes. And we haven't done um, extensive um, work in that area. Um, but we are currently doing some experiments to test how people who may not be as literate may use voice notes for, for WhatsApp, which um, is one of the areas that we're exploring. Um, as far as uh, operating in South Africa only, we as breakout.org, we don't operate only in South Africa. Um, we, we operate in many low and middle income countries, but particularly in Africa, being based in South Africa ourselves and being a South African organization. Um, we have actually implemented uh, programs that are similar to MomConnect in both Nigeria and Uganda. Um, with with other partners, um, and uh, you know we use the local context to adapt the mom, the program to be specific to that 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 area, and we do have plans to expand further um, uh, because we have a, a number of, of partnerships that we're looking at um, to help us to expand some of our work uh, to other countries, um, and then with respect to use of AI and what are some of the challenges and uh, the lessons learned, one of the the biggest challenges uh, for use of AI in most of our programs is that our um, la the languages that we communicate with people in, um, as you you know you asked earlier, what language is available? It's in eleven languages, but those eleven languages are considered resource poor um, from an artificial intelligence and natural language processing perspective. There is not a very strong language model for these languages, um, and there's not uh, the drive, the commercial drive to develop them for these languages. And so we've had to do a lot of work to develop um, our own with, with partners as well, but to develop our own language models. Um, and we've had to generate, to use large amounts of data to do that. So it's a bit chicken and egg because we had to start the program gather a lot of data and then develop the AI. <laughs> um, we couldn't just kick off straight away with AI because of the fact that it's resource poor. Um, some of the lessons that we've learned to definitely you know, to, to, and this is not just for us, I think be very careful about any bias that you, you introduce into artificial intelligence and test rigorously um, because the data that you use will have biases in it. it there's no way around that. So think about that very carefully. Um, and uh, again, maybe echoing what Jake said, you, you're going to need to partner with people with very specific skills. Um, this is not generally something that most NGOs will be able to take on um, without very specific technical skills, but there are great organizations out there doing work and actually a lot of interest from particularly academic institutions to work with these resource poor languages. Um, and so I think it's a very interesting opportunity as, as well as a learning. Great, thank you so much for that. Um, and I wanted to go ahead and bring um, Megan into this conversation as well about um, Debbie to your point of partnering with organizations that do have these skill sets um, when not all NGOs do. Um, Megan, I was struck by what you said about um, partnering with companies like Cisco, Google, Microsoft, TripAdvisor, and you mentioned financial and in-kind support, um, such as understanding human-centered design. 
Um, I'm guessing another form of in-kind support would be technical support. And I'm just curious to hear any advice for people who are tuning into this webinar right now who, you know, are excited about the idea of partnering with the likes of Google and Microsoft but don't really know where to begin or how to engage them? Yeah, I think that's that's a really good question, and it's definitely something that we have been learning, and I think we still are learning. Um, so one of the things I would say is coming with as specific an ask as possible. So recognizing what is the pe what is the piece that you can get from the company that you want to partner with. So whether it's knowledge about AI or um, natural language processing or um, access to hardware or to products, you know, being very clear about kind of what you want to get out of that partnership early on really helps the conversation get going in a productive direction. Um, otherwise, you, you know, you're coming to the table with some needs and they are coming to the table with other needs and they don't always match up and align. And I, so, so I think having those really honest conversations early on to identify where can you collaborate and where are your skills and needs complementary um, really make sure that the work that you do together is productive uh, as soon as possible. Great advice. Thanks for that. Um, and Jake, we have a few specific questions about the research. Um, so one is just to clarify um, basically smartphone um, and feature phone usage in Africa. So someone asks, does low smartphone figure in Africa mean there are no phones? or are basic flip phones the only feasible choice? Um, so can you expand on that? Sure, I mean, uh, low smartphone figures in Africa mean there are no phones? No, of, of course not. And and basic flip phone flip phones or feature phones um, are, are not the only feasible choice. Um, obviously it depends on where you're working, right? Context is very important. Um, and then again, this kind of highlights the need to really understand your user. You know, who are the users you're trying to communicate with? You would need to have some sort of understanding about, you know, who are the aggregators? What's their coverage? How are you going to determine, I think, is the big question. And one way, again, is to partner with folks that are, that are already working in these areas. Two would be to have a, a channel agnostic approach, or at least to the degree you can. Um, and so, you know, you, ha you do have to tailor your content. Um, Debbie already talked about language localization. That, that's um, one of the more difficult challenges I think any of these programs face that we have kind of glossed over a bit. Um, so, you know, obviously the channel that you use is going to, to limit the types of content that, that you, can, um, you can employ. If you're going to do a survey for feedback, um, trying to do that over SMS can get quite challenging and, and actually quite expensive if you're having to pay for all of those messages back and forth. Um, there's also a lot of errors in data entry, et cetera. So um, while you know the outlook is is that you know smartphone penetration will increase, mobile internet uh, penetration will increase, you, you have to understand where you're working. So there really is not a one-size-fits-all solution at this point, um, unfortunately. I do think that there's actually a, a huge um, potential for some for some company, maybe it's an aggregator or, or something else, to, to kind of provide a, a universal access that would automatically um, degrade or enhance the, the campaign by channel, right? So... Um, you could potentially start on one channel and, and end on another channel, but I think we're a ways away from that. And one follow-up there, um, you mentioned you have to understand where you're working, and I agree, so I love this question. Someone asked, what do you think are the best data sources on communication app penetration at the country level and also anything at the sub-national level? In, in order to, to find this information out? Is that yeah, I'm, I'm guessing this person is asking, you know, um, they, they've seen your research kind of looking at um, a broader snapshot, and if they want to zoom in country by country or even sub-nationally mm. to get a sense of, um, who, you know, at penetration, how can they do so? Where should they look? Well, I mean, GSMA obviously would be uh, a place to stop. Um, 
Jeez, Debbie, Megan, you guys have an idea? I'm trying to think about sub, the sub-national or district level. Yeah. It's, about... it's not easy. It's, yeah, <laughs> It's challenging. It's very, very challenging. And, and unfortunately, a lot of the data is old by the time that mm-hmm. it is published, even by, by GSMA. Um, and so what we usually do is obviously, you know, you start with an idea of that kind. You, I do often use the GSMA reports, to be honest, to get a, a, an idea of what the landscape looks like, but um, more qualitative um, investigations within the communities where you work um, and um, getting that into your human-centered design process as well is going to give you a much more accurate picture because you're not only looking at sub-nationally, but you're also looking at your target audience. So, for example, you might get a, a sub-national or even if you can, but you could get down to the province in some, re- uh, in some regions idea of what smartphone penetration is. But if you're speaking to women or men, it's likely that those are completely different. And so um, I would say a combination of that quantitative data, but using some qualitative data um, to to test your assumptions there. Yeah. And and just to clarify, oh, go ahead, Jake. Oh, I I just saw his clarification as well that he's asking about communication error channel penetration, right? Exactly, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think this is a gap, right? You may also, in, a, in addition to pre uh you may you may you know go to Viamo or some of those um, service providers that are already working in multiple countries. They would be a great first stop, I think. Um, again, this is you know trying to partner. Yeah. With it. it depends on are you are you really working just in one country? If so, you know you might take on some some of that discovery yourself but if you're looking to do broader campaigns across multiple countries then yeah i would definitely recommend working with with like pre couch or viamo or some of the folks that are actually you know doing this for our business great and just for those who may not be familiar i'm guessing those who are on this webinar would be familiar but um, GSMA, we're referring to the GSM Association. It's a trade body representing mobile network operators. Um, and I, I think one of the interesting themes in this conversation is the role that MNOs play and um, partnerships between the global development community and MNOs and some of the challenges and opportunities there. Um, so we only have a few minutes left. We've gotten to most questions. Um, there are a few we didn't get to. I'll just throw them out there to keep in mind and maybe. Um, our presenters can get back at a later point. There was a question about governments using messaging apps to meet the SDGs, and what are some examples of these use cases? So curious to hear about governments' work in this. Um, questions about messaging apps and behavior change and that link, um, which is something we haven't had too much time to get into, but maybe worth a follow-up story. Um, but with our last two minutes here, um, and just to prepare you all, um, Megan, Debbie, and Jake would love to just hear a final call to action of some kind. And again, we just have two minutes, but as quickly as possible, we've covered a lot of ground today. Um, What's the final call to action you have? And we can start with Megan. Um, I think my final call to action is is to really be user driven. So to not get sidetracked by the tech. Um, So as Debbie mentioned earlier, whenever we enter a context, we do an information ecosystem assessment specifically targeting the people that we're trying to reach because inevitably the larger quantitative numbers will be missing those groups. Um, And so we really wanna understand how they use communication channels like mobile apps, how they trust them or if they do or do not trust them, um, whether there's what the literacy level and levels and issues are. So really just get that granular understanding of how people are using these tools so that you can then meet them where they are. Fantastic, Debbie, on to you. Thanks. I think for me, I would say um, think about engagement and not just sending people information. It's so much more powerful than simply sending people discrete packets of information, but also understand um, that particularly when you're looking at IP messaging, there's not going to be a swap out for the types of experiences you may have had with SMS in the past. So don't expect that one channel is going to behave exactly the same as another channel. Great. And we'll wrap up with Jake. Um, I think <clears throat> most people are on on the call because they they kind of believe that this technology is is maybe more cost effective or efficient. Um, but uh, I would I would challenge your assumptions there and really ensure that you have a plan going in. What which of the 
predominant paradigms uh, are you are you trying to follow right are you trying to match people to, to services or something are you, are you doing this for behavior change are you trying to get feedback um, have a have a plan in terms of what your budget is because um, you know having supported a few programs you can get surprised as the if the if the campaign really takes off in terms of the total costs um, and and if in doubt um, you know, don't do it, you know, kind of ensure that you're doing no harm with the content uh, and your, your responsibility really uh, with the data. Great way to end it. Um, so we have come to the end of our scheduled time for this webinar. We'll be sending out a link to the recording of this webinar as well as a copy of the slide deck in an email soon. And we hope you'll join us for one of our upcoming digital events, which you can find a link to in the resource list widget. And if you can give us feedback by filling out the brief survey that will pop up once we're done here, we'd really appreciate it. Finally, a big thank you again to our panelists for your insights and to all of you for joining us.